<laughs> Chapter two. <clears throat> uh, in or order to get a better sense of exactly how, how the Baudelaire orphans felt and they began the grueling journey of the stairs to Mr. and Mrs. Squaller's penthouse apartment, you might find it useful to close your eyes as you read this chapter because the light was so dim from the small candles on the ground that it felt as if their eyes were closed even when they were looking as hard as they could. At each curve in the staircase, there was a door that led to the apartment on each floor and a pair of sliding elevator doors. From behind the sliding doors... The youngsters, of course, heard nothing, and the elevator had been shut down, but behind the door doors to the apartments, the children could hear the noises of people who lived in the building. When they reached the seventh floor, they heard two men laugh, and somebody told a joke. When they reached the twelfth floor, they heard the splashing of water as somebody took a bath. When they reached the 19th floor, they heard a woman say, uh, let them eat cake, in a voice with a strange accent. <clears throat> I wonder what people will hear when they walk by the penthouse apartment, Violet wondered out loud, when we are living there. I hope they hear me turning pages, Klaus said. Maybe Mr. and Mrs. Squaller will have some interesting books to read. Or maybe people will hear me using a wrench, Violet said. I hope the Squallers have some tools they let me use for my inventing. Crife, Sonny said, crawling carefully past uh, one of the kennels on the ground. Violet looked down at her and smiled. I don't think that will be a problem, Sonny, she said. You, us you usually find something or other to bite. Be sure to speak up when you want us to start carrying you. I wish somebody could carry me, Klaus said, clutching the banister for support. I'm getting tired. Me too, Violet admitted. Y you would think, after Count Olaf made us run all those laps when he was disguised as a gym teacher, that these stairs wouldn't tire us out, but that's not the case. What floor are we on anyway? I don't know, Klaus said. The doors aren't numbered, <laughs> and I've lost count. Well, we won't miss the penthouse, Violet said. It's on the top floor, so we'll just keep walking uh, until the stairs stop. I wish you could invent a device that could take us up the stairs, Klaus said. Violet smiled, although her siblings couldn't see it in the darkness. That, that device was invented a long time ago, she said. It's called an elevator, but elevators are out, remember? Klaus smiled too, and tired feet are in, he said. Remember that time, Violet said, when our parents attended the 16th annual run-a-thon and their feet were so tired when they got home that Dad prepared dinner while sitting on the kitchen floor instead of standing? Of course I remember, Klaus said. We had only salad because they couldn't stand up to reach the stove. It would have been a perfect meal for Aunt Josephine, Violet said, remembering one of the Baudelaire's previous guardians. She never wanted to use the stove because she thought it might explode. Pomerez, Sonny said sadly. She missed something along the lines of, as it turned out, the stove was the least of Aunt Josephine's problems. That's true, Violet said quietly. <sighs> <clears throat> <laughs> and the children heard her someone sneeze from behind a door. I, I wonder what the squalors will be like, Klaus said. Well, they must be wealthy to live on Dark Avenue, Violet said. Acrophil, Sonny said, which meant, and they're not afraid of heights, that's for sure. Klaus smiled and looked down at his sister. You sound tired, Sonny, he said. Violet and I can take turns carrying you. We'll switch every three floors. Violet nodded in agreement with Klaus's plan and then said yes out loud because she realized that her nod was invisible uh, 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 in the gloom. They continued up the staircase, and I'm sorry to say that the two older Baudelaire's took many, many turns holding Sunny. If the Baudelaire's had been going up a staircase of regular size, I would write the sentence up and up they went, but a more appropriate sentence would be up and up and up and up. Uh, it would take either 48 or 84 pages to reach they went because the staircase was so unbelievably lengthy. Occasionally, they would pass a shadowy figure of someone else walking down the stairs, but, but the children were too tired to say even good afternoon and later good evening to these other residents of 667 Dark Avenue. The boilers grew hungry. They grew achy, and they grew very tired of... 
gazing at uh, 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 identical candles and steps and doors. Just when uh, they could stand it no longer, they reached another candle and step and door, and about five fights after that, the stairs finally ended and, and, and deposited the tired children in a small room with one last candle sitting in the middle of the carpet. By the light of the candle, the Baudelaire orphans could see the door to their new home, and across the way, two pairs of sliding elevator doors with, with arrow buttons alongside. Just think, Violet said, panting from her long walk up the stairs. If elevators were in, we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, would have arrived uh, uh, at the squalor pen's house in just a few minutes. Well, maybe they'll be back in soon, Klaus said. I hope so. The other door must be to the squalor's apartment. Let's knock. They knocked on the door, and almost instantly, it swung open to reveal a tall man wearing a suit with long, narrow stripes down it. Such a suit is called a pinstripe suit, and is usually worn by people who are either movie stars or gangsters. I thought I heard someone approaching the door, the man said, giving the children a smile that was so big they could see it even in, even in the dim room. Please come in. My name is Jerome Squalor, and I'm so happy that you've come and stay with us. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. Squalor, Violet said, still panting, as she and her siblings w walked into an entryway almost as dim as the staircase. I'm Violet Baudelaire, and this is my brother Klaus and my sister Sunny. <laughs> Goodness, you sound out of breath, Mr. Squalor said. Luckily, I can think of two things to do about that. One is that you can stop calling me Mr. Squalor and, and start calling me Jerome. I'll call you three by your first names, too, and that way we'll all save breath. The second thing is, is that I'll make you a nice cold martini. Come right this way. A martini? Klaus asked. Isn't that an alcoholic beverage? Usually it is, Jerome agreed. But right now, al alcoholic martinis are out. Aqueous martinis are in. An aqueous martini is simply cold water served in a fancy glass with an olive in it, so it's perfectly legal for children as well as for adults. I've never ha had an aqueous martini, Violet said, but I'll try one. Ah! Jerome said, you're adventurous. I like that in a person. Your mother was adventurous too. You know, she and I were very good friends away, a ways back. We hiked up uh, Mount, Mount Fra with some friends. Gosh, it must have been 20 years ago. Mount Fra was known for having dangerous animals on it, but your mother wasn't afraid. But then, swooping out of the sky, Jerome... Who is that at the door? called a voice from the next room, and in walked a tall, slender woman, also dressed in a pinstripe suit. She had long fingernails that were so strongly polished that they shone even in the dim light. The Baudelaire children, of course, Jerome replied. But they're not coming today, the woman cried. Of course they are, Jerome said. I've been looking forward to it for days and days. You know, he said, turning from the woman to the Baudelaire's, I wanted to adopt you from the moment I heard about the fire, but unfortunately, it was impossible. Orphans were out then, the woman explained. Now they're in. My wife is always very attentive to what's in and what's out, Jerome said. I don't care about it much, but Esme feels differently. She was the only, uh, uh, she was the one who insisted on having the elevator removed. Esme, Esme, I was just about to make them some aqueous martinis. Would you like one? Oh, yes, Esme cried. Aqueous martinis are in. She walked quickly over to the children and looked them over. I'm Esme Gigi Genevieve Squalor, the city's sixth most important financial advisor, she announced grandly. Even though I am unbelievably wealthy, you may call me Esme. I'll learn your names later. I'm very happy you're here because orphans are in, and when all my friends hear that I have three real-life orphans, they'll be sick with jealousy, won't they, Jerome? I hope not, Jerome said, leading the children down a long, dim hallway to a huge, dim room that had various fancy couches, chairs, and tables. At the far end of the room was a series of windows, all with their shades drawn so that no light could get in. I don't like to hear of anybody getting sick. Well, have a seat, children, and we'll tell you a little bit about your new home. The Baudelaire sat down there in three huge chairs, grateful for the opportunity to rest their feet. 
Jerome crossed to one of the tables where a pitcher of water sat next to a bowl of olives and some fancy glasses and quickly prepared the aqueous martinis. Here you go, he said, handing uh, Esme and the children each a fancy glass. Let's see. In case you ever get lost, remember that your new address is 667 Dark Avenue in the penthouse apartment. Oh, don't tell them silly things like that, Esme said, waving her long nailed hand in front of her face as if a moth were attacking it. Children, here are some things you should know. Dark is in. Light is out. Stairs are in. Elevators are out. Pinstripe suits are in. Those horrible clothes you are wearing are out. What Esme means, Jerome said quickly, is that we want you to feel as comfortable here as possible. Violet took a sip of her aqueous martini. She was not surprised to find that it tasted like plain water with a slight hint of olive. She didn't like it much, but it did quench her thirst from the long climb up the stairs. That's very nice of you, she said. Mr. Poe told me about some of your previous guardians, Jerome said, shaking his head. I feel awful that you've had such terrible experiences and that we could have cared for you the entire time. It couldn't be helped, Esme said. When something is out, it's out, and orphans used to be out. I heard all about this Count Olaf person, too, Jerome said. <clears throat> I told the doorman not to let anyone in the building who looked even vaguely like the despicable man so you should be safe. That's a relief, Klaus said. <coughs> that dreadful man is supposed to be up on some mountain anyway, Esme said. Remember, Jerome? That unstylish banker said he was going away in a helicopter to go find those twins he kidnapped. <coughs> Actually, Violet said, the triplets, the quagmires, are good friends of ours. My word, Jerome said. You must be worried sick. <coughs> Well, uh, if they find them soon, Esme said, maybe we'll adopt them too. Five orphans. I'll be the innocent person in town. We certainly have room for them, Jerome said. This is a 71 bedroom apartment, children, so you will have your pick of, of rooms. Klaus, Poe mentioned something about your, your being interested in inventing things. Is that right? My sister's the inventor, Klaus replied. I'm more of a researcher myself. Well then, Jerome said, you could have the bedroom next to the library and, and Violet can <coughs> have the one that has a large wooden bench perfect for keeping tools. Sonny can be in the room between you two. How does that sound? That sounded absolutely splendid, of course, but the Baudelaire orphans did not get an opportunity to say so because the telephone rang just at that instant. I'll get it, I'll get it, Esme cried, and raced across the room to pick up the phone. Squalor residence, she said in, into the receiver, and then waited as the person spoke on the other end. Yes, this is Mrs. Squalor. Yes, yes, yes? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. She hung up the phone and turned to the children. Guess what, she asked. I have some fantastic news on what we were talking about. The quagmires have been found? Klaus asked hopefully. Who? Esme asked. Oh, them. No, they haven't been found. Don't be silly. Jerome, children, listen to me. Dark is out. Regular light is in. Well, I'm not sure I call that fantastic news, Jerome said, but it will be a relief to get some light around this place. Come on, Baudelaire's. Help me open... Help me open the shades and you can get a look at our view. You can see quite a bit from so high up. I'll go turn on all the lamps in the penthouse, as May said breathlessly. Quick, uh, quickly, before anybody sees that this apartment is still dark. As May dashed from the room, while Jerome gave the three siblings a little shrug and walked across the room to the windows. The Baudelaire's followed him and helped him open the heavy shades that were covering the windows. Instantly, sunlight streamed into the room, making them squint and their eyes adjusted to regular light. <coughs> if the Baudelaire's looked around the room now that it was properly illuminated, they would have seen just how fancy all the furniture was. The couches had pillows embroidered with silver, the chairs were all painted with gold paint, and the tables were made from wood. <coughs> Chopped away from some of the most expensive trees in the world. 
But the Baudelaire orphans were not looking around the room as luxurious as it was. They were looking out of the window onto the city below. <coughs> Spectacular view, don't you think? Jerome asked them, and they nodded in agreement. It was as if they were looking out on a tiny, tiny city with matchboxes instead of buildings and book bars instead of streets. They could see tiny colored shapes that looked like various in insects, but were really all the cars and carriages in town driving along the bookmarks until they reached the matchboxes where the tiny dots of people that lived and worked. <coughs> the Baudelaire's could see the neighborhood where they had lived with their parents and the parts of town where their friends had lived and, and in a faint blue strip far, far away, the beach where they had received the terrible news that had begun all their misfortune. <coughs> I knew you'd like it, Jerome said. <coughs> it's very expensive to live in a penthouse apartment, but I think it's worth, worth it for a view like this. Look, those tiny round boxes over there are orange juice factories. That sort of purplish building next to the park is my favorite restaurant. Oh, and look straight down. They're already cutting down those awful trees that made our street so dark. Of course they're cutting them down, Esme said, hurrying back into the room and blowing out a few candles that were sitting on the mantelpiece. Regular light is in, as in as aqueous martinis, pinstripes, and orphans. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny looked straight down and saw that Jerome was right. Those strange trees that had blocked out, out the sunlight on Dark Avenue, looking no taller than paper clips from such a great height, were being chopped down by little gardener dots. Even though the trees had made the street seem so gloomy, it seemed a shame to tear them all down, leaving bare stumps that, uh, from the penthouse window, looked like thumbtacks. The three siblings looked at one another and then back down to Dark Avenue. Those trees were no longer in, so the gardeners were getting rid of them. The Baudelaire's did not like to think of what would happen when orphans were, were no longer in either. <coughs>